Okay, uh, think. What can we teach the new hunters? Maybe something secret or hidden? My middle name is Lucius. I, um, it, it is? No, it's not. Then why would- Look, okay, I'm stressed out. Ladies, gentlemen, and monsters of all ages, with the return to Monster Hunter World event still essentially in full swing, with the peak concurrent players on Steam hitting well over 160,000, and while we seem to have stopped growing to significantly bigger numbers for the moment at least, we are still sitting in that 150 to 160,000 range on weekends, showing that a lot of people really are getting quite invested again. And it's a special kind of long-term invested that we're seeing, where most people playing the game again in fresh playthroughs aren't really rushing. They're taking their time to smell the roses, especially as alongside them are a surprisingly large number of totally new hunters as well. All that said, a lot of people are playing Monster Hunter World and Iceborne at the immediate moment, especially with fresh playthroughs. Some old hunters, some new, but with the game being out for six years now, there are a lot of things that you can forget or habits that you may have fallen out of. So we're going to go over a number of tips today for everyone with 20 things every world and Iceborne hunter should know. And I don't mean like shame on you if you didn't know this, just that these are less obvious things that can and will change the way that you play the game a bit from this point forwards. And we will go in a sort of ease of application order, meaning earlier entries are super easy to work into your gameplay, whereas further ones will take a bit more input or knowledge. First point of order then is actually just some setting changes, some more obvious, some less, and the first one is something that you can easily forget about until it rears its ugly head and gets you hit or something of the like, which is auto sheath. By default, in Monster Hunter World, auto sheath is a setting that is turned on. And essentially what this does is make it so anytime that you do not swing your weapon for more than a couple of seconds, you will sheathe it. And put simply, there are very easy ways to manually sheathe your weapon, like sprinting or pressing the item use button, and sheathing when you are trying to line up a specific attack, just automatically, is purely awkward. So just do yourself a favor and turn this off, it really doesn't help you at all. Second then, also is in the option menu, you want to go to your camera settings and change camera distance to far. This may not look like a massive amount, at least initially, but the camera zooms out further in combat than it does in town, and so the distance difference here is more drastic. Zooming the camera out simply makes it easier to see more of the fight at one time, so you have more information to work from. You can see more of your monster, you can see the attacks that would otherwise might be even off screen, it's just a better way to have this setting in the game. Then third is more of a personal one, but have a look at your HUD settings. You can turn on and off most individual sections of the HUD for the game, which can also really clean up your screen. For example, you can turn off the weapon input guide in the corner if you know what your buttons do already or you just don't want the game reminding you constantly. You can turn off the monster target list from being constantly on the bottom left of the screen as well. You can make it so your item bar only shows up when you are interacting with it and scrolling along it or using items, all kinds of things like this that just make it easier to see more of your screen and more of the fight, and it's entirely your choice what you want to leave on or off to find that happy spot for you. Fourth up is the radial menu and making proper use of it. Whether you are on keyboard and mouse or if you're using a controller, the radial menu acts as a sort of shortcut to specific items without slowly scrolling through the item bar. You can set this up entirely to your own personal specifications, and it can even include things like crafting items as well, which is especially useful for things like bowgun ammo. If you want to craft extra bowgun ammo during a hunt and you have it set to your radial menu to do so, you can do it in less than a second. Do a full stack of crafting without interacting with any of those menus, making it actually viable to do in combat. Fifth today is a simple trick that can save you a fair bit of time over time, and that is holding down the gather button when gathering or carving a monster. If you are mining an ore node, the animation will link up and progress faster if you hold down the mining interact button rather than pressing it three times individually. Same thing with carving monsters. This can actually save you a surprisingly large bit of time if you work that into your habits earlier in your journey rather than later. Six is a fun technical maneuver that I rarely if ever see people use if you have slinger ammo loaded while you are mounting a monster. You can press the right trigger or your equivalent to shotgun blast into the monster at point blank range. Especially if you have stronger special types of slinger ammo too, this does a good bit of extra damage and progresses the mount process faster than just stabbing the monster normally would. So especially for a solo player where you just want the mount to be over as quickly as possible, this is a great technique to learn. Seventh up is a bit of an interesting traversal tip, a thing that many hunters learn about early on and then sort of forget forever, which is if you fire slinger ammo at a wild wing drake on any of the maps, you can then attach to it and hitch a ride, essentially using it to fly you around the map. You can't really control its flight path all that well, but it's great for getting you to areas that are otherwise far away from your camps, or if you're wanting to travel vertically on a map quickly too, as of course they can fly. Eighth today is another somewhat traversal tip, but more just a special little tech move in combat, 
which is specifically interacting with sloped ground. Every weapon has a slide attack that it can do from sloped ground, and most weapons can even transfer that into the regular jump attack if you want to too, but you may not have known that you can actually skip part of the slide animation. If you are regularly traveling and running on sloped ground, you do a bit of a tripping and slipping animation before you properly enter the slide animation, and you cannot initiate a slide attack from the early part of that animation. However, if you roll on a sloped surface, you skip this sort of tripping animation and immediately start sliding much quicker than you would have otherwise. When fighting in certain areas, you can absolutely use that to your advantage and create sort of openings for slide attacks that you wouldn't have had if you did it normally. Ninth then is something that veteran hunters know extremely well, but absolutely needs to be talked about for any new players tuning into this. And that is the action that the community has dubbed the Superman Dive. This specific animation triggers if your weapon is sheathed, if you are sprinting away from a large monster, and then you also press the roll button. What this does is replace your normal standard roll with a full on belly flop dive to the floor. The normal roll has a pretty small number of iframes in the animation, which means it is really hard to dodge an attack through invulnerability with the roll. Comparatively, the Superman dive gives you iframes from the moment that you launch into the air until you start standing up again from the ground, which is a good couple of seconds of pure invincibility. If you didn't know about it, you should absolutely start using it. There are tons of attacks designed to be avoided through this specific action, but even further than this, this specific maneuver, it's also worth mentioning that 95% of the time that your hunter is on the ground, they're actually immune to damage. Most times you are hit by an attack, you'll be sent to the ground, and most new players will just constantly hold the movement button so they can go the direction that they want. But if you let go of all movement, you will actually stay on the ground for a few seconds longer. And by doing this, you can stay immune to damage if an attack is in danger of hitting right where you are laying down. This doesn't apply 100% of the time, but it's extremely useful to be aware of and mindful of at the very least. Tenth up is another solid interaction to always keep in mind, which is exhaustion animation canceling. When you are running around, you use stamina. If you run for too long without watching your stamina bar, your hunter will start flailing their limbs around to show exhaustion, and if you stop sprinting while in that animation, your hunter will sort of keel over and start breathing heavily to regain some stamina, and you get essentially locked on the spot until it fills up a bit. But you can actually cancel that happening in the first place by doing a weapon attack while in the flailing arms part of the animation. This skips the exhaustion lock and starts regenerating stamina immediately, and you can even immediately resheathe your weapon as well. Eleventh today is the oven roast function at the canteen. You can use this to cook various ingredients, with the one that I recommend the most being raw meat. This turns raw meat into rations, which are stamina refill items. Doing this is simply more efficient than manually cooking raw meats on the barbecue spit during a hunt, and even though it is less fun than using the barbecue spit, sure, it does get the job done a lot more effectively. Twelfth, and for a couple after it, we are going to be focusing on your items and your item loadout, with this specifically being a paramedic healing loadout, as I like to call it, which is the concept of having mega potions, potions, herbs, and honey all maxed out in your item pouch, so you can craft a second set of 10 mega potions for when the first set is over, then you also have 10 herbs to turn into 10 new potions, and you can always find more herbs and honey on the hunt to convert that even further to more mega potions, but you get the idea. You don't just get to have 10 mega potions and 10 potions, you can actually get yourself quite a bit more healing to carry in between trips to the tent quite simply. Next up then is traps, specifically shock traps and pitfall traps, but not just their base existence or anything like that, more specifically that a lot of people just don't use these unless they are trying to capture a monster, but they obviously give you a period of downtime when used as well. And so if you have the resources, you can absolutely bring one of these traps to each of your harder hunts against non-Elder Dragons at least to make it a fair bit easier. And you can even bring it a step further and go by the same concept as the last entry and bring trap tools and the other crafting materials required so that you can make even more traps in the field. Though it's worth mentioning that repeatedly trapping a monster over and over with the same kind of trap does have diminishing returns. After that, we have just a bunch of more niche items that you should absolutely be aware of the proper applications for and have a bit of a stock of sitting around. These include things like Astera Jerky. This instantly cures bleed, so it's obviously great for any monster that applies that status, but it also heals all of your red health instantly at the eating speed of a ration, so you can use it to counter things like Lunastra Supernova or Latreon Special Attack as well if you use it quickly enough. There are also Far Casters, which give you invulnerability frames after you use them and bring you back to the camp in an emergency, perhaps. Herbal Medicine, which cures poison faster than an antidote does, as well as healing you a little bit too. Power Charm and Armor Charm, which you can have increase your attack and defense just by sitting them in your item pouch and you can just buy them easily from the actual store. And then for these, you also can stack them with Power Talon and Armor Talon, which you craft after killing Basil Geese and getting some of his talons. There's also things like Wetfish Plus that are a unique material you get from fishing for Wetfish, and these essentially just function as more efficient whetstones, sharpening your weapon in a fraction of the time of the normal whetstone and having a decent chance of not being consumed on use as well. So if you farm some of these, then sharpening just becomes a non-consumption.
concern forever. The point is there are many niche items within this game, and this is just a handful of exceptional ones that I think more players should be using more often. 15th today, let's talk about some of the more unique applications of slinger ammo, specifically that slinger ammo generally has extra purposes on the map that it is located. For example, in the Rotten Vale, you can find torch pods on the ground, and you can use these in effluvium covered areas to clear out the effluvium that is surrounding the torch pod on the ground, or you can even use it in around insect enemies on the same map to make them leave you alone as they tend to dislike fire. Even more specific uses are things like Juratotus, Baroth, and even Brachydeos, having their slimy, gooey goodness, all of their sort of elemental bits, washed off of them when you shoot them with water moss, which simply weakens them and is a great way of using environmental water damage to make up for having a non-elemental weapon. Then let's talk about what feels like a permanently hot topic in the community, which is capturing monsters versus slaying them. Most people will swear that capturing monsters gives you more rewards than slaying them does, but that is simply not the case, at least not in World and Iceborne specifically. You get the same amount of quest rewards as a kill when you capture, but with three bonus to make up for the carves that you would have had if you killed. Many monsters do have different percentages on different part drops depending on whether you carve for them or get them from capture rewards, and you can see that in your hunter's notes, and this can tip the scales of value towards one or the other depending on what you're after. But on average, it's not really worse to kill than capture outside of the fact that you can save a fair bit of time hunting by doing so. But personally, I just enjoy the feeling of fully slaying things more often than not, honestly. Next up is something that only applies once you have the Iceborne expansion, as it is Clutch Claw specific. But the game tells you pretty much when you first get Clutch Claw about a specific interaction, but it does it in a pretty vague way. And so I find the vast majority of players seem completely unaware about this, at least at this point. But there is a special mechanical interaction between tenderizing monster parts and the wall bang slinger flint shot as well. When you do the wall bang, any tenderized parts of the monster will take bonus part damage. This doesn't increase the damage number specifically of the wall bang that the monster takes, but what it does is apply damage to that part specifically. So let's say you want to cut off a monster's tail. If you tenderize it, then throw the monster at the wall, and that wall bang damage now counts as applying to the monster's tail part health, which gives you an easier time cutting it off afterwards. Cool, right? Then past that, we have to have a very frank conversation. A lot of Monster Hunter players that get absorbed into the end game, at least, care about efficiency above all else. They love pure attack sets, pure offensive builds. They let them get the highest hit numbers possible. But unless you are an absolute god of hunting, you absolutely should work in at least a few defensive or utility skills into your set. To put it in the simplest possible words, a defense skill may lower your damage number by a little bit, but dying lowers your damage to zero. And if you die like three times, then it doesn't matter how much damage you did in the hunt in the first place place, because it's the equivalent of zero damage anyways. All that to say, ignore the people who complain about hunters who aren't full offense all the time. Use some defense and utility skills and give yourself some comfort. The two biggest ones that I could possibly recommend in this game are health boost, which literally raises your maximum health and makes you survive tons of attacks and combos that would kill you otherwise. This becomes obsolete in the final endgame builds, though, but until then, it's actually incredibly important. And then Divine Blessing. This is simply a random chance to reduce the damage that you take on any attack by a significant amount. Out. This can do anything from making an attack that would otherwise one-shot you, only do 60% of your health instead, to just reducing the poke damage you receive while you're guarding an attack, but it is genuinely just a lifesaver to have around. There's even niche situations where a utility skill, like heavy artillery, can come extremely in handy if you know where to use it. So understanding that not all skills need to say plus attack to be worth having is actually an important step in hunter growth. Then second to last, we have something particularly specific, which is unlocking a specific food skill by finding the the right canteen ingredients and completing the request. The food skill that we are after specifically is Feline Safeguard. This gives you insurance, which quite literally gives you one bonus cart when active. By doing this, you give yourself an increased chance in any hard hunt that you actually engage with, which is great in itself, and you get this to pop up extremely frequently by unblocking the ingredients for it. Five out of six of these ingredients are just commonly found, but the sixth is a rare one. We of course have a guide on this for greater detail if you want it, but to sum it up succinctly, you need the Hoarfrost Reach to have an upsurge in flourishing butterbirds, either in expedition or investigation. Then go to the northernmost middle zone of the map and follow this specific parkour path up to the top, where you can find one specific butterbird patch up there that can actually give you the snow white canteen ingredient to finish making safeguard food for yourself. Then finally today is a bit of a more abstract concept than a specific tip, but quite simply it is try other weapons. I don't know who specifically needs to hear this, but if you are someone who early on in your experience with Monster Hunter latched onto one specific weapon and then have used it pretty much exclusively since then, 
try something else. Try multiple something else's. Sure, you may have picked your current main because you thought it looked the coolest, but you may be surprised how many of the weapons actually feel much different to play than they do when you look at them, especially with the knowledge of the game that you might have gained up to this point. So I always recommend that people try out the various weapons of the game at different stages in their time playing Monster Hunter, as your opinions will change as you go, and you may find true love with a weapon that you never even considered actually using before giving it a proper spin. And that just about does it for today then everyone, a list of 20 things I think every Monster Hunter World and Iceborne Hunter should know, some of them being more specific and simple tips, others a bit more obscure or abstract, but all of them with the intention of hopefully teaching something new or even just reminding a bunch of hunters about some important game mechanics that can completely transform the feeling of a new playthrough in the game if you take them into account. I hope you've all enjoyed this then, and of course mention any more tips that you have like this in the comments down below. Like if you liked the video, subscribe to the notification bell for more, and most importantly, ladies and gentlemen, until next time, Time stay sweets. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos, dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes, bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement to take our insanity and turn it into entertainment. Yes, I said entertainment twice to reiterate that it is nice to look into your faces on a mostly daily basis when you let us in your homes to make the whole world a stage. Is uh goodbye.